It doesn't look too blurry. God loves you. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, God loves you. God loves you. Okay, very good. Stand with me as we read our, our text this morning. You're supposed to smile when you say that, though, right? You're supposed to smile. Okay. John 3.16 reads, and this is uh, John the Beloved who writes this, and of course, he writes this, and this passage, I've never really paid attention to it, but it's actually in red letter, meaning this is what Jesus said. And it reads, let's all read this together real slow, and it says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you, Father, for a wondrous time in your presence. You teach us, Father God, that you inhabit the praises of your people. Father, I would pray, Lord Jesus, as you take me down this basic text, Lord. You take us and, and you journey us this morning, Lord, to a text that is so loving, so embracing, Lord, so perfect in its, in its, in its writing, Lord Jesus. It is, again, it is in its simplest form what you uphold to, Lord. And I pray right now, Lord Jesus, as you hide me behind your precious cross this morning, that you will teach us, Lord, as I impart these truths to your people, Lord. Help us this morning, Lord, to know that you truly love us. In the mighty name of Jesus, and everybody says, Amen. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. You know what I love about Google and Yahoo? I love these Yahoo. search engines because you can find so many incredible things. Here's one. I don't know if you can see it up there. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay, look at it. It says, For God, Big G, right? That's G. And then it says, so love the world that he gave his one. O, right? One, G, O, and only son. See it? Son, G, O, S. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish. He perish, right? G, O, S, P, but have E, eternal life. What does that spell? Awesome. Got cute, huh? Anything is cute? Okay. Okay. Cute. <laughs> yeah. All right. It's okay. I'm going to like that. I'm good with that. All right. I thought it was kind of cool myself. That's what I guess when they said it encompasses the whole gospel, John 3 16. So, man, these guys are sharp. Many of you guys are underdressed. Okay. All right. Let's go. God's love is extravagant. Those of you that don't know what that word means, it means giving something of great value. And when you think of the word extravagant, uh, we we coined this phrase in, in this century called bling. Everything that we want, everything we desire. I mean, society even teaches us that there are certain things that we want in life. We want big houses, we want big cars, we want big wheels, we want big tires, we want big jobs, we want big money. Well, extravagant, in fact, I don't think you could put a value on what God did. I don't think you could even put a word on what God did. But the word extravagant is one of my first points, and when we think about it, we, we take a look at this passage, and it says, For God so, everybody say the word so. So, so. so love. And that word so is important for us because it's, it's extravagant. It's, it, it emphasizes something in the passage that we need to look at. It could have just read, For God loved. But God says that he loved us so much. It's almost like if I were to go to my wife. And I would say, honey, I love you. That's fine, right? But what if I say, honey, I love you so much. Right? All the guys go, oh, that's But it's just something that you need to look at. God loved the world 
He loved us so much. And you need to emphasize that. How did God love us? How did he love? Look at that passage right here. It's one of my favorite passages. Romans 5.8. But God demonstrated his own love for us, for us in this. While we were still what? Sinners. Christ died for us. Take that passage and put something instead of the word sinners there. While you were still muttering around in the world, meaning while you were doing things that you know you shouldn't have been doing, while you were out there being disobedient, while you were out carousing, partying, drinking, getting so drunk that you didn't know how to get home, getting so, I mean, filled with so many drugs that you didn't know what your first name was, while you were out stealing, while you were out hurting people, while you were out hurting your wife or your husband, whatever you were doing, God demonstrated his love for you while you were still doing those things, Christ died for you. So many of us look at that passage and say, God loved me that much? Yes, God loved you that much. He loved you so much. And I don't know how much I could emphasize the word extravagant. His love for us is that much. In other words, you were still being disobedient to him. You didn't even know God. And he still loved you. He loved you. I mean, think about your life right now. If somebody were to betray your love, couldn't you say, I love you so much? Maybe you would say, I like you. I mean, you need to really think about that because... Me as an individual, thank God I'm not God, because it'll be over for you guys. <laughs> I mean, I'm just being honest with you. Because I'm, I'm supposed to be taught that if God loves that much, then I should love that much. But I'm imperfect. I, I do mess up. But God so loved us so much that he demonstrated his love. That when I was just being the most rotten person that I could possibly be, that he loved. That's how extravagant his love is. Moving on. This is a passage I want you to go uh, uh, write down if you're taking notes. John, 1 John 3, 1. It says, see what great love the Father has lavished. Oh, I love that word. Look at that word. The great love that the Father has lavished on us, meaning his son, that we should be called children of God. And then what does it say? And that is what we are. Exclamation point. So if anybody ever asks you, you're a believer in Christ Jesus, what are you? I'm a child of the king. Amen. There should be no identity crisis when it comes to those of us that are in Christ Jesus. I'm a child of the king. Walk like you're a child of the king. Live like you're a child of the king. That's the way we as Christians should. No, there's not a certain air about us like some of those people walk. I'm talking about those people that walk around today in our society and they walk like, you know, they have that certain air about them. I'm not talking about that type of air. I'm talking about an understanding and a knowledge that I am a child of God. Amen? And that's what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that they did not know him. And that's a reminder to us. You know, when Jesus came and he told the individuals, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Because they asked him, show us the Father. He said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Because I and the Father are one. The same thing should be said of us, those of us that are in Christ Jesus. If you see my life, just like the Apostle Paul says, follow me as I follow the Lord. Your life should be a reflection of that of Christ Jesus. People should take notice that there's something different about you. So the Father's love that is lavished on us, the most extravagant, extravagant gift money could even buy. Of course, there is no amount of money that can buy that. Extensive. It's a big word. What is extensive? It means it covers a vast area. Okay? And the word love there. For God so loved the world, okay? Now, I want you to think about this real quick. So it's not really a question, it's a statement. Think of an individual that you do not like. Now, Pastor Ben, 
we're supposed to like everybody. Come on, let's be real. Okay? We're Christian people, Pastor Finn. We're supposed to forgive and love each other. Everything about our lives reflect Jesus Christ. We love every. Okay, you love them in the love of the Lord. But back in your mind, you say, no. How many of you got them bosses, you know, your supervisors, right? I treat you like, I didn't say it, right? Okay? You, you're telling me, I love them with the love of the Lord. Come on. Okay? I'm just letting you know that. So think about that individual that you do not like. Or someone in history that would be unlike today. And you think about that person. And I want you to, as you're, as you're thinking about that person, I want you to know that Jesus loved them. And, and, and you can put any person that you want there. And I can think of some individuals that are on death row today. So many people that have done heinous things to individuals. The most hated man in America, the, uh, the, the, the newspaper clip we once said, and it was this individual who would literally, uh, I guess he, he was a guy that, what's the word they use today? He was a player, okay? He knew how to just sue a woman. And he would get these women, and next you know it, we find out that these women are missing, and he was called the most hated man in America. And do you know that Dr. James Dobson got to see this man? And this man gave his life to Jesus Christ in prison. Now some of us think, no, that's not fair. Ted Bundy. That is not fair. Do you know what he did? Do you know how many people he hurt? That's not for you or I to judge. That's why God's grace is understandable. We can't comprehend it sometimes. I mean, all you got to do is think about your own life, and we have a, 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 a thing about our, our lives that we think sin, and I used this illustration before, that if I were to go to the grocery store right now and I see a beautiful Thompson seedless, it's one of those green grapes, and it's calling me. It literally is pulling me because it's so shiny and thick and juicy. And I were to walk up to it and just pluck it out of its, you know, and I put it in my mouth. Lights should start whistling all over the, the, the grocery store. And they should literally cuff me and take me away because I stole, right? Yeah. Come on. It's only a grape. Right? And then you think of the most heinous crime that people could do, like a serial killer. Do you know in God's eyes what I did and what he did is one and the same? Some of us look at that. Oh, no, that can't be. But I'm telling you, yes, it is. Sin. Is sin. Right. And we usually put degrees on sin. And that's, that's in our eyes because that's the way we as people think. But in God's eyes, sin is sin. Everybody say sin is sin. Because that's what it is. But God loved the world. God loved the world. It means it, it matters you know, what your color, your background, what you've been through, some of the things that you're doing in life. God loved the world. And as vast as this world is, God loved it. He loved it that much, amen? I don't think I'm expound any more than that. Expensive. I like expensive things. You look real expensive. <laughs> Now, I see kids that are dressed up like this. It reminds me. Do you mind if. Can you come up here with me real quick? Yeah. See, see this? Looking sharp. Okay, look. Now, I'm going to just let you know. Let me pray. I know you're clapping for me, but that's okay. All right. Now, just the illustration. This gray suit that I'm wearing, this is an illustration when you think of expensive. Did I know this was going to happen? No, I didn't know. But the, the, I'm wearing gray. Now, let's say I were to brush up against something dirty, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I am a man of God, and this is a young person, right? And let's say he's a man of God, too. And I brush up against something that is dirty. Would I be able to see it? No. Not really, right? No. But it's still there. Yeah. But him being a man of God, if he brushes up something dirty, this, I'll call it a garment of righteousness, 
Because that's what we're clothed with. When Jesus did what he did for us. When Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice for us for one time and one time only, paid the greatest expense, all you got to do is just point at yourself for you. Okay? Thank you. Okay? He gave. And, and then that's something we need to, when we, when we think of God's expense, that it costs something a lot of money. And when we think of a lot of money, we, we always equate that to some type of material thing, whether it be a house, cars, stocks, bonds, or whatever it is. We always think it has to do with some type of material value. But what did God give? God gave his only son. And when you think about giving your only son, it reminds me of a, a movie clip. I wish I could have put this on for you. Many of you probably have seen this movie clip. It was about a man who, who worked a bridge. And he worked this bridge, and the bridge is one of these drawbridges. The bridge would go up, and it would go down, and of course the train would come across. Well, one day he decided to bring his young son with him. Make a long story short, he was operating the bridge, and his son was in the office with them. He turned and he sees his son. Well, for a moment, he took his eyes off his son. And, and, and they're looking at my, my toy here. <laughs> they're saying, man, we could play some games while he's preaching. Because <laughs> there are games on here. <laughs> and so he was looking at, he, would, he looked at his son, noticed his son was there. Next thing you know, he, he started operating the bridge, you know, controls. Took his eyes off the sun when the sun left. Next thing you know it, the drawbridge was up for just a moment because he was letting one of these vessels, this ship vessel, go through. All of a sudden, a red light comes on and he sees that a train is coming. So he knows it's a normal day. So he begins to lower the bridge. He turns right away and he sees, where's my son? So he looks around as the bridge is starting to descend. And it takes some time for the bridge to descend. So he looks around and calls for his son, and his son doesn't pay any attention. There's no response. So he looks out, and as he looks out the window of his control room, he sees his son on the tracks. And he sees his son there and begins, I don't know how you would feel as a parent. And right away he begins to say, oh my God. And he begins to weep because he knows that the train is coming. And the train is filled with a lot of other people. They're going to work. They're going on vacation. They're going, they're just commuting from here to there. They're going shopping wherever they're going. But there's a lot of people on that train. And this, this, this bridge operator has to make a decision. Well, I'm not going to tell you what decision he made. But it was pretty much the same as the Father gave to us. He allowed the train as the drawbridge closed and his son perished. He gave his son's life so those people on the train would not die. That's what God gave. That expensive. Now as a parent, I would not, I, 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 I pray that I never have to make that decision. But for us to have to think like that, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only son so that you could live. That's the appreciation when we think of where the word God's love is expensive. And let me put the word there, so expensive. And that's what God has done. He has given us that. And when we think of God's love, again, going back, no matter what your situation in life was, he gave you his son. How do we know it says in Romans 8.32, He did not spare his own son, but he gave him up for us all. Everybody say all. all. Okay. You could make that more intimate. He gave him up for you. The same for me. How will, how, he, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Amen? Expansive. Covering a wide scope of people. Now, look at that word. For God so loved the world that what? He gave his only son, Jesus Christ, that whosoever. Now, that's a strange word. 
can remember the first time I was introduced to John 3.16. I didn't even think that was a word. But whosoever. What's a whosoever? What's a whosoever? You're the only whosoever? You know what? I always wondered why God allowed this penny of this word whosoever. Because if you think about it, now, I'm, I'm not trying to be arrogant, but let's say God decided to put, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that Ben Reversal, right, should not perish, right? Now, you think about that, people, right away, what was your assumption? That I would be the only Ben Reversal, right? Now, if I were to say John Smith, if there was a John Smith in the house, right, how many John Smiths are there in the world? quite a bit, right? So, if I were to see my name up there, I'm thinking, I know I'm not the only Ben, because when I look at some of the Facebook names, I know that there are other B reversals out there. Some of them are Benjamin, some of them are Benji, some are Betty. It doesn't matter, they still stole my name. Right? But the, if, if you were to put your name there, I, I, the question is, why would God put whosoever? Because it encompasses everybody. You are a whosoever. Yes, That's what I like about God's love is so expansive that he doesn't want to leave anybody out. If you're a tribal individual in Africa, you're a whosoever. If you're one of these IBM women working for some corporate company, you're a whosoever. If you're a... a uh, one of these hired hand attorneys in the corporate world, you're a whosoever. If you're a janitor at Stockton or Lincoln Unified, you're a whosoever. If you work at McDonald's on the night shift, you're a whosoever. If you work at 7-Eleven, you're a whosoever. If you live on Grand Street, 5th Street, America Street, or Lincoln or El Dorado, you are whosoever. So it encompasses everybody. And that's why I believe God put whosoever. It's a reminder to us that God's love for us is that way. And it's important for us to understand that. You need to look at this, this, this whole point right here, that God's love is expansive. He hasn't left anybody out. He loves everybody. And it's a reminder to me that sometimes you figure in the 21st century, I remember when Sister Lou and I were first, we were on the east side of town and we were going to move. And I would think, excuse me, I was thinking that we would have a problem with this, that, you know, we'd never encounter any kind of racial uh, situation or whatsoever. We drove. Uh, some of the doctors I used to work for, I was going to live in Western Ranch. So that, you know, I could have been your neighbor. <coughs> some people in Western Ranch believe they don't live in Stockton. Western Ranch is a city in itself. You live in Stockton. <laughs> but we were going to live in Brookside, and what happened was, we, Sister Lou and I, we went the first day, and of course they took us through the real estate person office and all that, and then all of a sudden, I didn't pay attention because I was overwhelmed. Come on, I was raised on South Grant Street. You know, I don't know anything about stuff like that, right? I know the comforts of my home. I didn't have my own bedroom, I had my own wall, right? <laughs> Those were the comforts of my home. I loved my home. I, everything about my home, we were raised. I were to go back to that home right now, I figured, that's just so small. One bathroom for eight children. I don't know how that worked. You know, I, I, to this day, I don't know how it worked. God be all the glory. Look, we're, we're okay. <laughs> okay. We, we make it. You know, I always wondered about that. But, but it's a reminder of us, here we were in Brookside, and we went through the whole preliminary thing, and, and of course, because in Brookside everything is tight, security and all that, well, we go in, and of course, there's always certain cards that they give you when you're a visitor. Well, the following day, Sister Lou and I, we went, we want to go look at the big, big houses. You know, I'm talking about the big, where the foyer, when you first enter the house, it's bigger than our house. Yes. We want to look at the, the big houses, right? So we go into these big houses, I mean, when you open the door and it looks like this large monster of a door, you know, the big doors, going to the great and powerful Oz has spoken, you know, those. So we go in, but 
I wanted to see those houses. Well, there's a security gate before we got in there. And of course, the previous day I got this card and I put it on my dash and I forgot. I left it on my dash, I figured, okay, we have the security card. The security guard comes out of tower, he looks at me and I, I had my, my 77 Pontiac, right? That's what it was, oh, that was the nicest looking Pontiac. It had original trues on it. Well, anyway, I rolled up and uh, the, the, the security guard comes and the first words out of his mouth was, Sir, wrong color. Now, being from the south side, what did I think? Right? I didn't think wrong color card. So, it reminds me when I think of whosoever. It, God doesn't care what color you are. God doesn't care what ethnicity, what culture you are, what your background, your economic, social background is. God loves you. You are a whosoever. I just wanted to share that with you, get it off my chest. You say, man, turn the page, okay? Let that go. <laughs> God's love is exclusive. Believes in Him. Everybody say, believes in Him. Believe. Now, that question, why then isn't everyone saved? <laughs> Think about this for a second. His love, God's love, is exclusive. What does that mean? It means it's limited. Oh, God's love is expansive. It's for everyone. It's a whosoever. But God's love is exclusive. Now, what does that mean? It means it's limited. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus, Jesus Christ, that whoever, whosoever, the word is, believes. There's an action word there. It means something has to take place. Some of us don't get this, but let me, let me make sure that you understand this. If I had Raider tickets, 49er tickets, Cowboy tickets, and I wouldn't have those other ones, but let's just say I did, okay? Or, or opera tickets, or movie tickets, or concert tickets, whatever you guys desire, okay? And let's say I had them, and every one of these tickets was worth $200 because you got the best seats in the house, right? Let's say I had them, maybe they're $500, right? And the thing is, is, I have the tickets. Somebody gave these tickets to me to give to you. You know I have the tickets. And I, you know that I can give them to you. But if you don't come and get the tickets, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> Whoever, whosoever believes, you have to come and receive the tickets. If you don't receive God's love, then you won't ever get it. I have the tickets. If you want these tickets, you have to come up here physically to take them. And that's something we as a body of believers, that's why the world, you say, why isn't the world, why isn't everybody saved? Because God's love is exclusive. They have to come up here and get God's love. They have to receive it. And a lot of people have not received. They know of God's love. For God came into the world. We celebrate Christmas all the time. For those of you that call it happy holidays and, and, and uh, what else do they call it? Xmas Eve and all this other stuff. It is Christmas. Christmas Eve. Because Jesus Christ, you see this Christian word, Emmanuel? It means God with us. It means God came down from heaven to be with us. So when we think of, I know this is not a Christmas sermon, but I just wanted to make sure everybody understand. His love is exclusive. It's limited to those individuals that want to receive his love. If you're still wondering, oh, all I have to do is believe in God? No. Because even the devil believes there's a God. Even his agents and his, and his what do they call those of? The principalities and all those other, you know, uh, bad angels, they believe that there's a God, but they have not received his love. And the opportunity was always there for us. So why isn't the world, why isn't everybody saved? Because they know there is a God, but they have not received his love. Look at this passage. Everybody reads John 3.16. But they don't always continue to read. 
It says John 3, 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. condemned. That means condemned means you're not going to hell. That's what that means. Whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned. But then there's a big but. It says, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Okay? Moving on. How much time do I have? Still have some time. Exceptional. Something that is exceptional, it means it's, it's something beyond what is normal. It's, it's the unusual. Okay? And the word there says, will not perish. What does, what does perish mean? I'll just everybody know the word. You see it on your, your cans and your, your, your perishables, right? That means you could literally throw it away, right? And I decided to leave this second part on there. I don't like to put a lot on there. Or my PowerPoint, but if you look at it, everyone will be alive somewhere after they die. In fact, Joel even says this. You're all going to die, but the question is, is where? That is something that when we think of God's love, God's love is exceptional. But the word perish reminds us of, and in fact, I even looked at the, the original language of the word perish. It means separation from God. In other words, if you're not, if you're not in Christ Jesus, you're going to perish and you're going to be separated from God. Now, some of us think we're in the world right now. We're living in this world. And we think, okay, God's here with us. There's going to come a day where God will not be with one of us. Some of us are going to go and be in the presence of God. And the rest of us are going to go to hell. Oh, Pastor Ben, that's kind of harsh. <clears throat> but I can't put it any other way. I can't, I can't, there's no gray area. There's no, well... If you kind of, if you kind of come over here a little bit, then maybe you have a chance to go to heaven. Wrong. If, if you give a little bit of money to the charities or whatever, maybe you can still come and get in. Wrong. But the Bible says, and the day of the Lord will be like Noah. Noah cried out to all the people. Rain is coming. Of course, back in those days, they didn't know what rain was. But he says that there was going to be a great flood. And the people laughed at it. And they persecuted him because he was building this great ark. The day came where the only people that were spared during that day were his family. And of course, the door shut. And that door, when it shut, that was God's judgment on the people. Now, there was no gray area then and there will be no gray area now. Jesus is coming back. And when Jesus comes back, it will be only those that, when Jesus says, I have tickets, I have tickets. Come and get these tickets. It's my love. Those of us that grab these tickets will not perish. The question is, where will you live eternity? Of course, my last point. God's love is, ex is eternal. And you will have everlasting life. What does everlasting life mean? Now, there's a passage I want you to, I'm going to turn to you. And some people have even asked me this question because I know this is, this is something that I've embraced. But I, this is something that I'm letting you know. This, why have I embraced this truth? Now, some people ask me, Pastor Ben, are you one of those guys that believes in eternal security? If you don't know what eternal security means, it means that once you're saved, you're always saved. No, I'm here to tell you. I don't have a discussion about that because I only tell them, I only believe what the Bible teaches. I know we put certain teachings and doctrines and all this stuff, but I just believe and grab hold of what the Bible teaches. And if the Bible teaches this, then I have to embrace it because... From cover to cover, some of us have a tendency, well, there's only certain things that I take out of the Bible. Well, that's fine. I know that there are some preachers that preach only the good things of the Bible. They'll have to stand before God when it comes to that. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach from cover to cover. 
And this is a passage that the Apostle Paul writes in, in chapter 8, verse 38. For he says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Now you can, Paul kind of goes through a category of all these things that we will probably endure. And Paul knows that because he endured most of these things. That's why he penned these. This was personal to Paul. And Paul writes these things to us because he endured these things. And he says that nothing in all of creation will be able to separate us from what? From the love that is in Christ Jesus. So to answer eternal, Revelation 21. One, another one of my favorite passages. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. So God's love is eternal. And this is his promise. That one of these days, we will not have to endure all the hardships of this world. You won't have to pay bills. Worry about somebody turning off your power. Pay taxes. You won't have to worry about Uncle Sam banging on your door saying you have to pay taxes. You won't have to, the grind, I call it the grind where we have to work and have to get up and, and begrudgingly go to work. You won't have to do a lot of things. There won't be no more sorrow, or crying, or mourning. All the pains of these worlds will pass away, and we will be with God forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever.